And here we are in Berlin filming in two of the world's greatest collections of European art, the Borda Museum and the Gemelde Galerie. And these collections span a period from the third century all the way to the 18th century. What's fascinating is so many of the works in these collections feature works of sacred subject matter and of Christian art in particular. Christianity, of course, is the predominant religion of Western Europe, the predominant power in lots of ways in people's lives through all of those centuries. And it's the faith that inspired both artists and patrons to create some of the greatest masterpieces of Western art. And you can't turn a corner in either of these museums without coming face to face with examples of that creativity and brilliance. It's true, and these patrons and artists were creating these works to inspire devotion and to glorify their God. What's interesting today, centuries after these artworks were made, I think so many of those stories have now become lost, and visitors looking at them may not be familiar both of the stories of the sacred figures represented, but perhaps how those objects were used and those greater resonances. And as scholars that specialize in the field of sacred art, me being an art historian and, and you a theologian, I think it's really exciting for us to try and unlock the greater meanings of these artworks and make them come alive for contemporary audiences. You and I work together in London on a project called the Visual Commentary on Scripture, which opens up texts of the Bible that may, as you say, be quite alien to many people through works of art, allowing them to sort of spring back to life again. And what's especially exciting about partnering with these two museums in Berlin is that we get to do that now live, as it were, with three-dimensional objects and, um, and again, not just explore what they meant to people in the past, but also what they can continue to mean to new audiences today. Yes, and so for this first series of films, we decided to start with the figure of Jesus Christ, who better? Fascinatingly, one of the most commonly used symbols to represent the whole of Jesus' life is a cross. And this is something we see on jewelry and coats of arms. And it stands in for a key part of his life, the end of his life, his execution on the cross. So I think we should begin this series with an evocation of his crucifixion. And there's one just over here. So Jenny, you described the fact that this is a life that ended with an execution, uh, a particular execution, the supreme penalty that the Roman Empire reserved for criminals, often from the lowest echelons of society, very often enslaved people, uh, a grisly form of death which involved being nailed to a cross through both hands and feet. But it would have been a huge shock to Jesus' first followers who regarded him as the Messiah. Christ is a title, not a name, and, and is the Greek version of the Jewish title Messiah which means an anointed one, one chosen by God to uh, act on God's behalf to liberate his people and bring a new era of righteousness and justice into being. So for Jesus' first followers, who had such faith in him, such hope for what he might bring about, the sudden curtailment of his life in this horrific way required a massive rethink about what, what it could all mean, what their following of him could mean and what his life might mean. And they turned to the language of sacrifice to make sense of it, um, partly inspired by Jesus' own teachings. And they saw this not merely as an execution imposed on him from outside by the powers that be, but as a, as a path chosen willingly by him, a path that was in its way an offering to God, an acceptable sacrifice which is why one of the most typical ways in which uh, you will encounter crucifixes today is above an altar, a place of sacrifice in Christian churches as the focus of the ritual worship and gathering of Christian people. That's fascinating because here in the border, they've very cleverly installed this crucifix by an Italian artist called Antonio Begarelli from the 16th century, very appropriately above an imagined altar. And here we are in the recreation of a 15th century Italian church. All of the objects in this space are deliberately keyed to the sacred settings in which they are placed. The sacredness, I think, infuses this, but it's a very bizarre thing to really think about it because you have the trappings of angelic glory gathered around this abject figure and the most splendid architecture and indeed the most refined artistic skill, all devoted to a man 
in, in this excruciating position. And I think that's part of the, the paradox that we want to explore in these films, that a figure brought so low, almost to the worst point you could be brought imaginable, um, then becomes the figure who's the center of, of worship um, within only a few centuries of his death becomes uh, recognized and celebrated even by the emperors of the empire that once put him to death as not only human but also divine and that central double claim about Jesus that he's fully human and fully divine is something we'll explore throughout these films and that will inform all of the art that we'll look at. Uh, that that should happen, that huge reversal should happen um, is I think one of the most extraordinary things in human history. It's so interesting to me that this entire story of Jesus's life, as you're describing it, is here distilled down to this one moment at the very end of his life. But of course, there are a number of objects that include all of the key events in his life. And I think we should look at that type of object next. We were just looking at the Begarelli sculpture of the crucifixion in the Boda Museum. And now here we are in the Gemal de Galerie. And if we look over here, we see the exact same scene of the crucifixion painted in this work, probably painted in the first decades of the 15th century by a German artist working in and around Cologne. And what this work shows us is the crucifixion situated within a whole series of events within Jesus's life. I think this profusion of scenes shows us that although the crucifixion is perhaps the most represented scene from the life of Christ, his whole life is ripe ground, fertile ground for visual depiction. And yet there's perhaps something quite surprising about that because Jesus himself was a Jew and was born into a, a religious context where there were some quite strict prohibitions against making images, above all images of God, but actually other graven images too, which might attract false worship. And yet Christianity is possibly one of the most visual of, of all religions and grows out of Judaism. And I think the reason for that is all to do with Jesus himself. Because Christians believe he is the image of God, he is both divine and human, and in some way God has chosen to make God's self visible to make God's self a visual thing, mm. uh, to give people a visual experience of the divine in the form of Christ. And so uh, if God has done that, then artists too can do their bit, can join in, and, and, and in a sense you get a kind of extending outwards of this first act of self-representation by God into all of this wonderful, glorious profusion of representations of Jesus. And it's those visualizations that we're going to explore over the series of films that we've made both here at the Gemelle de Galerie and at the Bode Museum. It's almost like this is a trailer for the films that are to come. Mm -hmm.